Welcome to you, Council. In our previous lecture, we had explained what is an affidavit of documents and when does it need to be prepared and produced. In this lecture, we take a step further and explain how do you determine which documents are relevant and ought to be disclosed in your affidavit of documents. We begin with our usual disclaimer that this lecture is not legal advice. If you have any specific questions regarding your issues, you should contact a lawyer or paralegal or the Law Society of Ontario for a referral. Now, Rule 30.03 and 76.03 sub 1 of the Rules of Civil Procedure discuss affidavit of documents and explain what should be contained in that affidavit of document. We have explained that in our previous lecture. If you haven't watched it, please do so before reviewing this lecture. Broadly speaking, the rules require that parties should disclose all documents in parties' knowledge, information, and belief. These documents should be relevant to any matters in issue in the action, and they are either or have either in the party's possession, control, or power, or have been in the past in party's possession, control, or power. All of those documents ought to be disclosed in the affidavit of documents, and once again, please review our other lecture. In today's lecture, we'll talk about how do you determine which document is relevant and which document is not relevant. And this could be described as relevance test. There are a number of definitions that have been set out in, in various court cases. We have picked a few just to give you a flavor of how the courts have explained relevance in different contexts. First example, any two facts to which it is applied, i.e. relevance, are so related to each other that according to the common course of events, one either taken by itself or in connection with other facts, proves or renders probable the past, present, or future existence or non-existence of the other. That's one example. I'll let you think about it and come back to it, read it again. Another example, for one fact to be relevant to another, there must be a connection or nexus between the two, which makes it possible to infer the existence of one from the existence of the other. One fact is not relevant to another if it does not have real probative value. One more definition, requires a determination of whether, as a matter of human experience and logic, the existence of fact A makes the existence or non-existence of fact B more probable than it would be without the existence of fact A. If it does, not, does, then fact A is relevant to fact B. As long as fact B is in itself a material fact in issue or is relevant to a material fact in issue in the litigation, the fact A is relevant and prima facie admissible. One more example, and I'll have one more in, in the end. Any document which directly or indirectly may enable a party to advance his own case or destroy that of his adversary, or which may fairly lead to a train of inquiry to disclose evidence which may have either of those consequences must be disclosed. And finally, relevance is based on the party's pleadings to determine if the documents sought are relevant. I must decide if the documents sought tend to prove or disprove a proposition or fact advanced in the party's pleadings. Now, I have given you all these examples so that a you can repeatedly read them these are quotes from actual cases court cases and so you can understand that courts have defined relevance in so many different ways once you complete the reading you may come to the understanding that all of these definitions are more or less the same but i can tell you that they are not and the courts have defined relevance differently and that is why it is important for you to understand how the relevance test is actually applied. So all of the definitions that I've given, not all of them are uniform, not all of them are considered equal. To properly understand relevance, I believe one way to do so is to understand the history of relevance test. So in the past, in Ontario, the test for relevance was called semblance of relevance. And now, as of 2010, the rules were amended, and now the test is simply relevance. So the difference between the two is very simple. In semblance of relevance, the documents that were considered relevant uh, were viewed broadly. So if there was any chance, any semblance that the document could be relevant to the issues in that uh, court action, then they will be considered relevant. But in 2010, the, the court has, the rules have narrowed 
the definition of relevance. So the documents must be relevant to the issues, to one of the issues or any of the issues in the litigation. If they're not relevant, then, then it's not a matter of they could be or there's a semblance of relevance. So the definition is narrow. And there were a few reasons for changing these rules. Some of the reasons were that the courts did not want parties to conduct fishing expedition, go looking for evidence that may not even be relevant and trying to find out a case and trying to find out evidence to support their position or destroy the other party's position. Because it took longer, it cost more, and it may have been disproportionate to the case that was before the court. So the that, that was one reason. The other reason was the courts wanted to deal with issues efficiently and so the narrower the definition is all the relevant documents will be produced and the documents that are irrelevant will not waste courts time unnecessarily parties time money and effort in in weeding through all those documents that could be could not be relevant to the issues so in any event the definition was changed and so what you want to take away from today's lecture is that the definition now is narrower either the document is relevant or it's not um, the, the semblance of relevance test is no longer there. So on that basis, I want to go back. Um, as I said, when you review those definitions that I give you, the there's one definition, this one that I read, any document which directly or indirectly may enable a party to advance his own case or destroy that of his adversary, or which may fairly lead to a train of inquiry to disclose evidence which may have either of those consequences must be disclosed. Now, this is... I, I believe that when I read all these definitions, I did not find this definition to be particularly different than all of the other definitions that I read. But apparently, as the courts have um, stated that this definition is different, it is too broad. It was from one of the British Columbia court cases, which was quoted in one of the Ontario cases. One master relied on this definition and decided uh, on certain relevance of certain documents. When the case was appealed, the court overturned master's decision and basically said that this particular definition um, is related to semblance of relevance test, not the relevance test, which is um, presently enforced in Ontario. The next definition that I picked up, which I honestly believe is not much different than the one that I just read, is this one. This is from a 2019 case, which basically says that if the document tends to prove or disprove a proposition or fact advanced in the party's pleadings, then that document is relevant. And this is probably the simplest way to look at it. If you have stated a fact or there's a fact in, in your pleadings or other parties' pleadings, then you look at the document and, and then you determine whether that document proves any of the things that are stated in that uh, uh, in that pleading. And, and if it is not, then or if it advances that position, confirms it or denies it, uh, then it is relevant. If it doesn't do anything to that particular statement or position, then it is not considered relevant. Now, how do you figure all of this out? As I said, the definitions are not uniform. We talked about the history. So then determining relevance is really a practical matter. If you have done this for a few years, like lawyers do, then it is relatively, relatively easier for you to determine which document is relevant and which is not, but there are a number of fights about these issues that happen in courts all the time, and that is simply because two parties, using their common sense, using their experience, may not agree on what document is relevant and what is not. So it's really a practical matter. The court uses experience and judgment to determine which document is indeed relevant. Let's give you an example so that you may be able to get some sense of what a document, which document could be relevant. Let's take a fact. And we assume this fact is part of a party's pleadings. The fact says the defendant delivered its invoice by email to the plaintiff on January 3rd, 2019. This is a fact that has been stated. If the other party challenges it, disputes this fact, then this fact needs to be proven, right? And if this fact needs to be proven, then that particular email that we're talking about here is a relevant document. It ought to be disclosed because this email is the one which attaches an invoice and it was sent on January 3rd by the defendant to the plaintiff. So the email in a very simple commonsensical way is a relevant document that ought to be produced. Now, let's say the defendant had sent another email to the plaintiff on the same day on a different matter, not in closing an invoice, but on something else. Is that e an email that is relevant? No, it's not relevant as far as this particular fact is concerned. Because the existence of that email, the content of that email, as long as it does not contain that invoice, does not on its face 
provide support this fact in any way. Now, that email, that second email, could be relevant on some other issue. For example, that email could state, um, let's say that the parties, in this case, uh, the plaintiff advances a position that the plaintiff and the defendant had never communicated by email. Let's say that is one of the position that has been advanced by the plaintiff. Then in that instance, the second email becomes relevant because that is an email that actually challenges, disputes that position advanced by plaintiff because it proves that there was an email that was sent by the defendant to the plaintiff, right? So you essentially look at the fact that has been pleaded by you or by the other side and look at the evidence and then figure out whether the issues in that uh, pleading are advanced, challenged, or in any way connected to that particular um, document. And if that document proves or disproves that particular fact or position, then that document is relevant. So what to take away from today's lecture? First of all, when you're drafting pleadings, you have to be extremely careful. So you have to very accurately state your facts because whatever you state, whatever position you advance, remember that you will have to prove that by evidence, either documentary evidence or viva voce evidence, but you'll have to prove it. So you want to make sure that your pleadings are accurate in terms of the evidence that you're going to later provide. You also want to carefully review other parties' pleadings because when you review your own documents or other sites' document, you may be able to find discrepancy in their pleadings and their evidence, and you will be able to challenge their position, the facts or position, by relying on that particular pieces of evidence. And also, not to forget that when you have this obligation to disclose all these documents, you want to carefully assess all the documents to make sure that they are relevant and you are disclosing all those documents. Now, a related and important rule that you want to keep in mind is Rule 30.05, which says that disclosure or production of a document shall not be taken as an ad admission of its relevance or admissibility. So what this rule does is that if you, if you want to caution, err on the side of caution and produce documents that you believe may be relevant, you're not sure, you, you disclose them in any way, that does not mean you are, you are taking the position or you're admitting that the document is indeed relevant. So this particular rule saves you from, from that position. So the other side will not then hold you accountable and say, because you disclosed this document, you have confirmed the admissibility of that document as a relevant document, or you, you want this document to be admitted as evidence. That is not the case. So there is no sort of deemed uh, relevance or deemed admission just because a document has been disclosed. So that means that you can, you can if, if, if you err and include documents that were, that were you were not sure that they were relevant or not, that will be fine. At trial, you can, you, can, you can state the position that you believe the documents were not relevant. So hopefully, this is, this is a complicated area. As I said, uh, two lawyers cannot agree at times on what documents are relevant, what is not. But at least it gives you um, a line of thinking in terms of how you figure out when you're looking through your documents or other sites' documents to make a determination whether the documents are relevant or not. So hopefully this was helpful. We'll, we'll bring more lectures on these topics as we go along. Thank you for watching.